church or know the scriptures. It wasn't that long ago in here that Joe taught us during the life of King David where this gentleman comes up. The story is found in 1 Samuel 20. I'm not going to read much. You're just going to have to listen to some of the history here. And let me back up a little to say the continual war between the Philistines and the Israelites was growing hot about now, and things are starting to go downhill for God's people. The Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. Eli dies when he hears the news, and Samuel comes to lead the people through a very, very difficult time. A time is passing. Samuel is getting older, and the people begin asking for a king. God is against that, but gives them what they want after he tells them through the prophet how bad it'll be. So Samuel anoints the first king of Israel, Saul. He's an impressive young man, 30 years old, a head taller than the others. There's a ceremony, and some are reluctant, even in Saul's heart. The deed is done, though. The new king begins and begins very well. Some don't accept his rule very quickly, but he shows himself and his skill to be excellent. He defeats the Ammonites with the army and delivers the people of Jabesh Gilead. He's confirmed as King Samuel begins to slip out of the picture, and it's right about now that Saul's three sons come into focus, especially one, especially one. His name is Jonathan. He's a warrior like his father. He fights and he wins, sometimes single-handedly, sometimes with his armor bearer at his side, and sometimes with other soldiers, but he continually outwits and defeats the Philistines. It appears he is an expert at guerrilla warfare. Things are going better for Israel. Saul's starting to make some decisions, though, that are contrary to the will of God. Samuel rebukes him for doing his own thing and rushing ahead of God and disobeying the Lord. One time he acts like a priest. He's not a priest. He offers sacrifices, which he should not do. Another time God tells him to destroy all of the Amalekites and everything they have, and he saves the best for last, the king and the animals, and God is displeased. Samuel delivers to him the famous words, to obey is better than sacrifice. And because of his sin, Samuel tells him that God has rejected him as king and another is coming. And it says at the end of that chapter, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. But you turn the page to the next chapter in the story, chapter 16, and Samuel anoints a young man out of nowhere, a man named David, a boy long before he's a man, not the king of Israel. He's just a shepherd. As the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David in power, the Spirit of the Lord departs from Saul, and the evil spirit comes to torment the king, and he sends out word hoping to find somebody who could comfort him, who can play a harp and help him, and David is the one. He plays, and Saul's miserable days are made better with music. David becomes an armor bearer for the troubled king, and the whole time Saul likes this young man, at least for now. But the day comes that maybe you remember, this is a famous story, chapter 17, where this young man kills a Goliath of a man. He's a giant, and he gains the praise of all the people. Saul's popularity sinks, David's rises, Saul becomes jealous hates him and wants to kill him, even trying on two occasions to pin him to a wall with his spear. Saul sends him out to fight, but every time he does, David wins the battle. Victory after victory secures everyone's love for him, and Saul's blood boils even more. He tries to trap David, take him out, kill him, and he can't. He becomes obsessed with getting him, killing him, and David knows it's about time for him to flee. Right about now, we the Lord through the scripture lifts the veil on the friendship that has developed. We don't even see it happening, but David's friendship with this unlikely source, the king's own son, Jonathan. David tells Jonathan how much his father hates him and wants to kill him, and Jonathan can't believe it. But in chapter 20, 20 it all becomes very clear. So the two young men hatch the plan. Jonathan will get the word from his father, the truth, and he will get word to David, whether he can stay because he's safe or he needs to flee because he's in danger of being killed. The plan is complicated in my world, but maybe not yours. He would shoot three arrows into the field, tell the young man, the boy with him, the servant to go get him, and depending where he shot it and where he needs to go, David will hear that and know whether he can stay or needs to go. 
Well, Saul's hatred for David even comes to meet Jonathan because Jonathan makes his dad mad. He says, David must die, and in anger, Saul curses his own son and hurls a spear at him too. Earlier, the scriptures had said of Jonathan, David loved him as he loved himself, and when David learned the news from Jonathan, both of them were brokenhearted. It was time for David to leave, and here's where it says, they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Two young men don't cry like that unless that friendship is beyond normal. David flees, runs for his life, goes all over Israel trying to hide from Saul who is pursuing him at every turn. God blesses him wherever he goes, even into the enemy territory. He is growing in faith. Saul is losing it in faith and in body, in mind. David holds on to his faith. The king is tormented, cannot kill him. Even when David has a chance to kill Saul, he won't. He honors God and the Lord's anointed too much for that. But the day comes when Saul dies. He is killed, murdered on Mount Gilboa during a fierce fighting with the Philistines. And the sad news comes to David that Saul and his sons died with him. So he knows the truth. David knows Jonathan's gone. And David and all of Israel mourn for Saul and Jonathan, but David's love for Jonathan comes out in these words as he says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love was wonderful for me, wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Now that sounds odd to us, I know. Uh, sadly, some have construed that love between David and Jonathan to be somewhat so, uh, homosexual. There's nothing in all of Scripture to support that. In fact, what we know of David defies that, his love for women. I think it's sad even that folks want to twist that friendship into something like that. In a different day, in a different culture, that kind of language would be appropriate, and we would understand it as godly back then. But even if we think that's odd, we know friendship between two men in a good way, in a godly way, and when we see it, we admire it. It's blessed by God between two men who love the Lord. So, so here's the next one we need on our journey of life. Everyone needs a Rhoda, everyone needs a Jethro, and everyone needs a Jonathan. If you're going to make it to the end, on the, to the end of the road of faith, you need Jonathan on your team and in your corner. Jonathan is a true friend, and you need a true friend. Everybody has friends. Most people know but there are times when life is hard and a friend or a brother steps in to help like nobody else can. And when the storms strike, when you're on your back, when you're sinking in the mud, you wonder if you can breathe, you don't know if you can live till tomorrow. A friend or a brother like that is not a luxury, but a necessity. The wise teacher in Proverbs 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. True friends are blessings from God, not just to make our day and lighten our load and share our memories, but they help us make it to heaven. And the difference between just a friend and a true friend is seen in Jonathan. What is Jonathan? Why is he or she so special? Sweet says some of this. Jonathan is loyal even when you make it hard to be loyal. Jonathan walks with you in all seasons, like the winter of your discontent, when the gloom settles like a fog around your soul and nothing can be done until it lifts. Jonathan stops the internal bleeding from your blanched body when depression drains the life from your soul. Jonathan won't let you surrender to your dark side. A Jonathan holds on to you for dear life when you're about to fall into the grave of a black bottomless pit where death hides. A Jonathan has seen you in all your treachery and sinfulness at your most heinous and transparent and loves you anyway. A Jonathan keeps you in check when you want what you cannot have. And most of all, he says, a, a Jonathan sacrifices himself for you, even knowing as the original Jonathan knew that the more your song rises, the more his or her song fades into the background. Jonathan is willing to leave a, lead a life of decreasing significance, as like John the Baptist put it eloquently about Jesus, he must become greater and I must become less. 
Harry Potter had Ron, the Lone Ranger had Tonto, Batman had Robin, Abbott had Costello, Lewis and Martin and Lucille and Ethel and Taylor Swift, God bless her, has Travis. Do you have a Jonathan? A Jonathan is more than a buddy, an acquaintance, a companion, a friend in general. It's like what we read this morning, if you were listening to Proverbs, a man of many companions just might come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And if you have someone like that, then God bless you, and I hope you bless them. I think maybe we throw the word friend around too easily. Even best friend more often gets overused, especially as my three girls experienced it in elementary school. She's my best friend. No, she's my best friend. The next day, you got a whole new group of best friends. Maybe as Sweet says, we should talk about a true friend or a faithful friend instead of a best friend. Syriac says, faithful friends are a sturdy shelter. Whoever finds one has found a treasure Faithful friends are life-saving medicine. It reminds me of a favorite song of mine, and I have a lot. This is by Twyla Paris called Faithful Friend. She wrote it about a friend of hers. The words are, everyone knows you as a man of honor, but I am glad to know you as simply as a friend. You have always taken time to be my brother, and I'll be standing by you to the end. I will never put you on a pedestal. I thank the Lord for everything you do. I'll be there to pray for you and for the ones you love. I believe that he will finish all he started in you. I will be an open door that you can count on anywhere you are and anywhere you've been. I will be an honest heart you can depend on. I will be a faithful friend. It is more than finding and having a friend. It is being a friend like that. And I suppose the older we get, the more we really see the value in a true friend. Someone who said, someone has said, a friend walks in when everyone else walks out. That kind of a friend. As we get older, we see how uncommon a true friend in this world is. The rare species, if you can find them. Finding one is tough, like a diamond in the rough. But being one is also difficult too. Why is maintaining a friendship like David and Jonathan so difficult? Well, Sweet says three things, really three syndromes that we all fight against. One is the what's in it for me syndrome. This is the world of me, 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 and me. It's ego land, not a theme park. It's our homeland. It's where we live and breathe and work. It's America. We call friends our networks. We help them help us. We expect them to move us to the next level, move up on the ladder. Friends are used and disposed of. They're not nearly as important as we would make them out to be. But a Jonathan's different. Jonathan asks, what's in it for you? Like a good restaurant server, how can I help you? But to get there, the ego has to get blocked or banished or sent to the back of the line. The self The self has to be put in its place so that that other one can find significance. And jealousy and rivalry and greed and indifference and self-absorption and pride and ambition, all of those kill a relationship. They kill Jonathan in you or in me. Then there's the no down elevator syndrome. He says, the author, some of us are better at friendships than others. Males are notoriously culturally disadvantaged in the friends department. Newspaper columnist Laura Marcus claimed that the typical male idea of a best friend is somebody I hadn't seen in 10 years. Maybe guys aren't good at taking the elevator down to make a true friend out of somebody. That's the the imagery that Dan uh, Montgomery, a clinical psychologist, uses when he talks about this elevator, the intimacy elevator. He says, all of us live on the facade level, public appearances. We talk small talk like how the chief's doing. That's That's facade. That's okay. Everybody works there and lives there, but it's got to go lower. The next floor down is the acquaintance level, where you start talking about what you really think, maybe your sentiments, your feelings, your opinions. At this level, level we say things, but maybe stay away from politics and religion and sex. You go down to the next floor down, the friendship level, and you really start sharing some emotional vulnerability. We share some of our feelings, hold back the deeper ones maybe, but start checking out, can we be compatible? Can we 
have some empathy? Can we have trust for one another? If it goes well, you go down, well, you go down to the fourth floor, which is the intimacy level. That's where you come clean with the dark side, the memories, the wounds, the rejection, the story that has made you who you are, sometimes shameful to disclose, but you say it to a true friend. You share your heart. And psychologists have said that our ability to completely trust one other person is kind of a test of our real health as a human. And then there's the, what, me, sacrifice? Me, sacrifice? Yeah, right. That's the syndrome that Americans also face. Time is money and money is short. And we don't want to give it up for just anybody. So a lot of us don't want to invest time into another person. But we must if we want a really good friend. So if everybody needs a Jonathan, do you have yours? Maybe yours is your mom or your dad, a brother or a sister, a a relative, a, a friend, a neighbor. Maybe it is your spouse. Who is your Jonathan and to whom are you a faithful friend? When two friends are meeting each other's needs and helping each other out and carrying each other's loads, it really is a beautiful thing. Like this parable about two brothers. Two brothers worked together on a family farm. One was married, had a large family. The other was single. And at the day's end, they, they shared everything equally, both produce and profit. One day, the single brother says to himself, it's not right that we should share equally. I'm alone. My needs are simple. So... Each night, he decided to take a sack of grain from his bin through the darkness between their houses and dump it in his brother's bin. The married brother at one point said to himself, it's not right that we share the burden between each other. I mean, I'm married, but I have all of this, and he has just himself. So one night, he would, and from then on, he would take a grain of sack from his bin and slip over to his brother's bin and dump it in there. Both men were puzzled for years. They just didn't understand why their grain never dwindled until the night when they bumped into each other in the dark of night and it dawned on them what had been happening. They dropped their sacks and embraced each other gladly. A Jonathan can be your brother or sister more times than not. It's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I hope, I hope some of your dearest friends are brothers or sisters in Christ. At the worst of times, thank God if you have someone who is like that, who gives and helps and sacrifices and sometimes even saves your life. When a shooter opened fire at the Mad Butcher grocery store, Fordyce, Arkansas, just a couple months ago, June 21st, if you remember the story, nobody could believe it. Those who saw it knew the gunman and also knew some of the folks there. He was not from there, but near there and Before he was stopped by the police, he had killed, shot, killed four and injured others, 11, I think. One of the ones who died, maybe you heard her story, 23-year-old nurse named Callie Weems. Her cousin had done something similar that same day, and both of them, both of them were killed because Callie was helping the wounded. She leaves behind a 10-month-old daughter at the time. And it's not surprising that right after that happened and they knew what she was doing, that they started calling her a hero. Because who does that? She could have fled to safety, but instead she stayed. Some said she rushed in to help. Who takes a bullet for another? For a stranger? For a friend? Who does that? Every time it happens like that, and it does happen, we are marveling at it. Wow! But what amazes us most, especially in a room like this, on a day like this, is that Jesus did so much more. His words were, there is no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends, and then he did it. More than he said it, he did it. He didn't take a bullet, he was crucified on a cross. He didn't die for a friend or a neighbor, neighbor, but an undeserving world. And he didn't even have to, but he did it to save us. Romans 5, favorite passage in all the Bible. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Please hear this. God did not love the good people. He loved the worst people. 
Jesus didn't die for the nice ones, the honorable ones, the decent ones. He died for the verifiable sinners just like me. What will you do with that truth? Many of us in this room heard that good news at some point in our life. Some of us grew up with it. And how could we not put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? How could we not turn our backs on our sins in repentance on our knees saying, forgive me? How could we not be united with him in baptism so we could be forgiven and saved? So you've heard it. A friend, more than a friend. So how will you respond to that? Let's stand and sing. Just as I am without